recommend. First of all, we'll repeat the urine test. And the, the key aspect is, you know, many times a primary care physician will do just a simple like automated test in their office. But the key thing is to have someone in the, in the laboratory, you know, look at the urine under a microscope and they need to actually count, you know, how, to what extent do they see blood in the urine. Uh, we'll also do, you know, a blood test to see how well the patient's kidneys are functioning. And then the last two aspects, cystoscopy and then a CAT scan or an MRI. So we need to do, get some images from the radiology department, you know, to take some pictures from the kidneys all the way down to your bladder. And cystoscopy is something that's done in the office. It's where a camera is placed into the bladder. So colonoscopy to evaluate the colon. Cystoscopy is something that's done to evaluate the urinary tract. Many times, you know, we'll do this full workup for a patient, and sometimes we don't even find a reason for why there was blood in the urine. It's just a matter of, you know, monitoring the urine on an annual basis and you know, repeating the evaluation and dealing with it accordingly. So as far as what we're looking for, just trying to get the laser pointer to go here. I've probably pressed every button except the right one. Oh, this is the laser? Okay. You know, so when we send patients for a CAT scan, we're basically evaluating everything from the kidneys all the way down to the, the bladder. You know, and then obviously in men, we're focusing on uh, some of their, you know, relevant organs that you wouldn't have in the female. So this is a side view of a man that's looking to his left. So you have the bladder is this structure. Uh, when a man urinates, the bladder will empty and the urine actually flows through this purple structure, which is the prostate, and then out the penis. And just as far as, you know, highlighting where this is located, the prostate, you know, sits just beneath the bladder. Uh, it sits just in front of the, the rectum. So when the urologist does a, a digital rectal exam, they're basically placing their finger into the rectum to, you know, feel the back of the prostate. As I mentioned, the last part of the workup, which is done in the office, is the cystoscopy. And the large majority of patients do have this done in the office under local anesthesia. This is a tiny camera, this, the cystoscope, which is it's a flexible camera. Uh, and it's about the size of um, like a drinking straw or, or a catheter that would be placed into the bladder. Basically, we use some lubricating jelly and then simply insert it into the bladder just to evaluate the lining of the bladder and the urethra. And the reason this is important is because CAT scans or MRIs are very detailed, but sometimes we find things that, you know, they're so early on that you can't quite see them yet on a CAT scan or an MRI. So that's what the role of a cystoscopy is. It takes about five minutes. Most patients tolerate it just fine. Um, they may have some, you know, increased frequency or urgency of urination afterwards, um, but it's nothing that, you know, some over-the-counter Tylenol can't deal with. So that's sort of the, the rundown of the workup for blood in the urine. Um, as far as, you know, what could increase the risk of finding a cancer, first of all, we recommend doing this workup in anyone over the age of 35 if they've had visible blood in the urine in the past, if they were a smoker, and then all of these other you know, key factors are important in the patient's history. If they worked with chemicals you know, as part of their occupation, if they've had prior radiation, prior urological issues, uh, chronic urinary tract infections, or if they have chronic symptoms of frequency, burning, uh, urgency of urination. These are all you know, clues to a possible urological cancer. So one of the, the possible causes of a urological cancer is an enlarged prostate or BPH. This is a, certainly a common condition in men as they get older. Uh, basically, the, the prostate does have two growth periods, early in puberty and then beginning at the age of 25 and as a man continues to grow older. And how common is BPH? You know, Half of all men between the ages of 50 and 60 
have an enlarged prostate due to BPH. Uh, once a man reaches 80, uh, up to 90% of these men will have symptoms of an enlarged prostate to a certain extent. But this is a benign condition and it's, it is not a cancer. So again, this is a, another side view, you know, of the male urinary tract. So the prostate sitting just below the bladder. So BPH forms particularly within the central portion of the prostate, which is called the transition zone. But what happens is if the, the channel for the urine, if this gets, you know, blocked by an enlarged prostate, uh, the bladder will have to work harder over time. And if it's subtle here, but the bladder wall starts to get thicker a man will have to strain harder to pass urine through the prostate and out of the urethra. This can be associated with um, several other symptoms, such as the symptoms here. Uh, you may feel that the bladder is full even after urinating. You may have urgency, the feeling that you can't wait to get to the bathroom. The stream might, will probably be a lot weaker. You may have some dribbling. Uh, the flow may start and stop. You might have to push very hard to even get the urine out. Um, and this is all due to the fact that the, the inner portion of the prostate gets enlarged and basically that channel uh, doesn't allow the urine to flow out as easily as it can in a, in a man who's in his 20s. So how does this affect one's life? So in most men, these symptoms will gradually progress as they get older. Uh, ultimately, it can possibly lead to bladder damage, infection. It can cause microscopic or visible blood in the urine. And in those patients who have such a degree of obstruction that they can't even urinate, you know, the pressure either has to go, you know, out the body or it'll be delivered back up towards the kidneys, and that can actually lead to some kidney damage. So as far as risk factors... Aging, as a man gets older, if there's a family history, uh, some of these other factors can contribute obesity or a lack of physical activity. So can uh, BPH be prevented? Uh, there are some factors which can be, you know, altered or modified to help try to prevent this. Uh, diet may play a role because excess body fat can affect hormone levels. Certainly losing weight and eating a healthy diet is beneficial for a variety of reasons. And then staying active will help weight and hormone levels. So, you know, there are some things that can contribute, but ultimately, it, um, if this is what, you know, is deemed to happen to your body, it's, it, it ultimately may just be a matter of time. So when your primary doctor refers a man, you know, for evaluation of a large prostate or if someone just comes for evaluation. Some of the things we'll do, you know, in addition to getting a history, there are some standardized questionnaires where we can actually, you know, um, assign a score, a, a numerical score to uh, describe how severe are the man's symptoms. We'll do some urine testing to rule out microscopic blood or infection. Uh, we may do a blood test to screen for the risk of prostate cancer. And then there are some other uh, mechanical things we can do in the office. Uh, we have some machines that, you know, the man can urinate in. It tells us how fast is the man urinating. And that number we can compare to, you know, the average man of that age. We can do an ultrasound in the office after someone goes to the bathroom to see how much urine is left over in the bladder. Uh, if you have an elevated residual volume, that's certainly an indicator of an enlarged prostate. And then there's some other, you know, diagnostic tests as well, depending upon, you know, what other things have been tried to treat it and, you know, if the patient ultimately decides to have this treated surgically. So again, when a, your physician examines a man, you know, basically by placing a finger into the rectum, they're feeling the back of the prostate here. And the key thing is that can enable us to assess, you know, how large is the prostate, but if there are any nodules or any hard areas that are felt that may be suggestive of a, of a prostate cancer that has yet to be diagnosed. So if a man has bothersome urinary symptoms that are most likely due to BPH, what can be done? 
if it's just a matter of, you know, there are minimal symptoms, it hasn't really affected the man's quality of life, it's certainly an option just to monitor the symptoms, you know, have a reassessment in three or six months' time to see how the patient's doing. If the symptoms have become particularly bothersome and they're affecting a man's quality of life, that's when we start to offer some of the other therapies, such as medications and ultimately uh, surgery, if indicated. So Flomax is one of the common medications that is given to men, and this is a medication that falls under the class of alpha blockers. It's a medication that's taken once a day to relax the prostate, and then that allows a man to empty the bladder more effectively. It may increase the flow of urine, and it may decrease frequency, decrease the urgency. These are generally very safe medications. They have some side effects. They may cause nasal congestion. Um, they may have some sexual side effects, not erectile dysfunction, but they may decrease the amount of uh, semen during sexual activity. But overall, they're well tolerated and don't interact really with any medications. The other medication is no, uh, that's commonly prescribed is known as Proscar or Finasteride. The difference, with, and that's this class of medication, the difference with that medication is that will actually shrink the prostate over time, but that, um, that takes about six months for that to you know, have some effect on a man. So medications such as Flomax, within a week, a man should start to see some improvement. Uh, with the other one, it may take several months before you see an improvement. So if a man's been on medications, you know, for at least a month, yes, please. So alpha blockers are known, you know, one of the common ones is Flomax, and usually within a few days to a week, you would start to see some improvement in your symptoms. The, the other ones, you know, such as Proscar, which is commonly prescribed, that will take at least six months before it has some effect, because... So these medications affect how the body metabolizes testosterone. So that will have an effect on, it may decrease a man's libido or interest in sexual activity. It may affect erectile function also. Are those long-term medications or do you take those forever or? Yeah, it, uh, in some patients, if they're significantly improved, uh, their, their symptoms and their quality of life, they can certainly continue on these medications permanently. You know, if you stop these medications, certainly the, prox the prostate will no longer be relaxed. Uh, the prostate may continue to grow. Uh, some patients do fine with the medications, but they, they don't like the idea of having to take pills on a daily basis. So they may ultimately opt for a surgery so they can be off the pills. So, and that's, a little bit of what's summarized here, you know, in those patients that consider surgery, some of the things that you have to think about is, you know, first of all, how large is the man's prostate? That may determine what is the best option for surgery. Uh, how healthy is the patient otherwise? Or can they tolerate anesthesia? Uh, and what is their personal choice? The best candidates for surgery have moderate to severe symptoms. And we can actually assign a number score to that based on some of these standard questionnaires. If the patient has a history of, you know, blood in the urine or complete blockage where they can't urinate or if they're actually forming stones in their bladder, uh, that would be a good candidate for surgery. Um, if they're urinating very slowly or if they think they're not benefiting from any of the pills, these would be some of the good candidates for a surgical therapy. So one of the common procedures, which has been performed for many years now, is known as a TERP, or a transurethral resection of the prostate. So it's done on an, an outpatient basis. You know, the patient can typically sometimes go home the same day or the following day. There's no cuts made to that. There's no incisions anywhere on the body. But basically, um, uh, a camera is inserted through the penis, and then there is a, a cautery loop on the end of this, and basically, the part of the prostate that's blocking the channel is, is 
is basically just shaved out to create a nice wide opening to create a bigger passage for the, for the urine to pass. So this is, again is a side view of a man lying on his back. You know, his head would be towards this direction, his feet this way. So this scope is inserted through the penis and then basically all of this tissue would be cored out. There are some newer techniques which are now available, one of which is a Eurolift. So this would be a view of a, you know, this would be the patient's bladder here, and this is a, an obstructing prostate because the urine can't flow through here. So basically a scope is inserted. This is a same day procedure where a patient would almost certainly go home the same day. And these permanent uh, sort of uh, prosthetic stents, if you will, will be placed inside within the prostate to basically squeeze these two lobes of the prostate to create a, a wider opening to allow the urine to pass much more easily. So this is a newer technique that there's five-year data for now, but uh, some urologists are even doing this in the office with some oral anesthesia and some pre-medication regimens, so it may not even require going to the hospital. So that's basically everything I wanted to review as far as um, enlarged prostate and BPH, as far as men's, you know, men's health and one of the common complaints that we see in men as they age. And the, the last topic, which I'll focus on for the, the next several minutes, applies to both men and women. You know, kidney stones, uh, why do they form? How are they treated? How can they be prevented? And again, if anyone has questions, you can certainly chime in about the other topics. Sure. Uh, what, uh, what is the credibility that you attach to um, PSA for folks our age, 70 and plus? I just read yesterday that uh, there was a release of information that folks over 70 don't even, not even get a PSA Right, and so that, that was uh, in the news within the past week or so. The, yes. the United States Preventive Services Task Force, which you know, evaluates you know, guidelines from all of the medical specialties, previously had assigned a D rating to mm -hmm. prostate cancer screening because they thought all of the, the risks of you know, screening and treatment outweigh the benefits of what's typically a very slow-growing cancer. But they recently upgraded it to a C rating, meaning that they think that patients should participate in decision making with their provider about prostate cancer screening. So the guidelines from the American Neurological Association tell us that we generally should focus on those men between 55 and 70 because those men typically have a, at least a 10 year life expectancy and they would have the most benefit from prostate cancer screening. The thought is that for every uh, 1,000 men that are screened, you can prevent one death. As far as patients over the age of 70, the thought is that, you know, if these men haven't been diagnosed with prostate cancer at that point, it's probably not going to be a problem for them, you know, for the rest, you know, going forward if they were diagnosed. And the thought is that if those patients are over the age of 70 and they're otherwise pretty healthy and maybe they have at least a 15 or 20 year life expectancy, you know, those men, you know, should discuss, you know, prostate cancer screening with their provider and maybe they should use different cutoffs of a PSA for when you would actually consider a biopsy. So maybe trying to only diagnose those cancers that are aggressive enough that would warrant treatment as opposed to the less aggressive, low-grade cancers, which can just be uh, monitored without, you know, any treatment. Thank you. Sure. Yes. What exactly uh. happens to the prostate during radiation treatment? So with a radiation treatment for prostate cancer, uh, it can be delivered in a variety of forms. Some patients will have radioactive seeds that are placed in the prostate on a one-time procedure. Uh, other patients may go for daily pelvic radiation uh, over the course of several weeks. 
ultimately with radiation, the prostate is still in the body, but the thought is the radiation should, you know, cause damage to the DNA of the prostate to sort of induce damage, shrink the prostate, and prevent further growth of those cancer cells. It, the size of the prostate will shrink over time. Similarly, when you examine a man with a rectal exam, it, it will feel it has a characteristic examination to it. It's basically a flat prostate. Can it, can it affect the flow of uh, urine? So with radiation, the side effects with regards to urination will be realized not immediately, but you know, 12 months, two years down the road, you'll start to see some of those side effects. As opposed to surgery, you'll see the side effects immediately. Those will improve over time. With radiation, you may not see some of those urinary or bowel side effects, but one or two years down the road, you may have, you may have blood in the urine, you may have some increased uh, urinary symptoms. Yeah, so in, in addition to pelvic radiation and seeds, there, you know, something that do, the radiation oncologists at the, the Bennett Cancer Center offer at Stanford is CyberKnife, which is a form of pelvic radiation therapy that's, you know, more focused to the prostate and minimizing scatter to the surrounding areas. I think what you may have been referring to, there was a recent article in the New York Times where certain academic institutions are doing really short courses of high-dose radiation um, it's nothing that's, you know, fully described in some of the guidelines yet, but this, it's certainly an area of academic interest and, you know, other, you know, institutions, there's study with regards to doing focal therapy, you know, you, you know, treating only part of the prostate with really focused, you know, therapies. Um, these are all, all topics that I think will be, uh, you know, widely discussed at the, the national meeting next month, which is actually over in Boston. But uh, I'm sure that'll be part of it. What is the difference between cyberknife and radiation? So ultimately, a radiation oncologist will determine, you know, what amount of radiation and how long it should be administered. But it's it's based upon, you know, what kind of cancer the patient has. So what is their PSA? Uh, what is their rectal exam? Uh, if the patient's had a biopsy, how many biopsies were positive, and then. The pathologist also describes the, the biopsies. Do the cells look very aggressive or do they look non-aggressive? That will ultimately determine what course of radiation is indicated. CyberKnife is a kind of radiation that is similar to a form of pelvic radiation therapy, but you know, there, there's an ability to focus it more on the prostate and minimize scatter to the surrounding areas. Ultimately, those, you know, of our patients that are diagnosed that are interested in learning about radiation, we'll refer them to uh, one of the radiation oncologists to learn about the, the various options that are available. Yes? I wonder how, how you, if someone kind of has about the uh, role play of genetics mm -hmm. and current genetic research of anything that's going on in terms of uh, genetic testing uh, for certain cancers that are going on in women races in the Middle East, etc. Sure. Uh, you know, there's a high tendency to people who are uh, Afro-Americans in regards to the kind of higher propensity to acquire uh, you know, perhaps prostate cancer tendencies. Uh, I wonder if you could talk just a little bit about what those factors are. Right. So as far as, you know, when we first start to screen a man for prostate cancer with PSA screening, as I said, the, the goal population is between the ages of 55 and 70, but if a man is African American or if there is a, a strong family history of first degree relatives, whether it's a man's father or a brother, that certainly places a man at high risk. So we would start to screen those patients between the ages of 40 and 55. And that would be with, you know, starting to do digital rectal examinations first and also uh, starting PSA screening sooner. There, there is a lot of, you know, interest in also trying to determine, you know, which patients truly would warrant 
uh, a biopsy. So there are some newer tests that can be done before a biopsy to help a man, you know, determine, you know, should I go through with a prostate biopsy? And these are some, uh, some of which are urine tests. There are some blood tests that are looking at some proteins that are related to PSA. And there are some data uh, on these tests now that, uh, you know, if a man, you know, a primary care doctor will check a PSA on a man, there are some blood tests uh, now that can not only say what is a man's risk of having prostate cancer overall, but what is his risk of having a particularly aggressive kind of cancer. And that information can be used to determine, you know, who really warrants undergoing a biopsy and who can safely be followed with just annual PSAs. Um, there are also some tests that can be done after a biopsy is done. You know, biopsies are not uh, very, um, you're only sampling a small portion of the prostate, so how can we know, have we sampled the truly aggressive parts of the prostate? Did we possibly miss something? So there are some new tests where we can, you know, take part of the biopsy. There are some companies that are looking at uh, a variety of genes on the biopsy specimens, and they can actually extrapolate and help us determine who really has the aggressive kinds of cancer, and that can help us determine who needs surgery, who needs radiation, or who can just be followed uh, with active surveillance, you know, monitoring the PSA and monitoring the, the exam. And maybe we can safely postpone surgery or radiation and not subject patients to some of the possible side effects. Yes? about logical weighting as a concept that people many times think it's a side effect? Right, so, you know, watchful waiting is, is commonly, you know, the, the, the most conservative management of prostate cancer would be either watchful waiting or active surveillance. The difference between watchful waiting and active surveillance really is uh, active surveillance means, you know, monitoring the man's PSA typically every six months, uh, monitoring their digital rectal exam to see if there's been any changes, and then also doing a follow-up biopsy you know, typically, you know, 12 to 18 months later to see, you know, has the cancer progressed? Are there more biopsies that are positive? Are the cells more aggressive or are they, you know, a similar level of aggressiveness? And that would be more of active surveillance because you're doing active measures to monitor the cancer. There is data that for the men with a low risk, non-aggressive cancer, that their mortality over 10 years is similar to those men that undergo surgery or radiation. So there's no difference whether they just watched their cancer or had uh, some form of intervention. And this would be for ages below 70? It's, it depends. Um, it depends on uh, a variety of factors. Um, it may depend on the man's life expectancy, you know, if they have a, a life expectancy less than 10 years and if they have a particularly, you know, less aggressive kind of cancer, then certainly watching those patients uh, is a reasonable option. In those men that are younger, if they have a long life expectancy, but if, if, they only ha if they have a low PSA, if they only have one or two of their 12 biopsies that are positive, if they have a benign exam, those patients may be good candidates for surveillance as well. Yeah, yes? So as far as uh, immunotherapy, this has a role in some patients that, the, um, that may have already had cancer that's spread to other parts of the body. Okay. So if they have metastatic prostate cancer, uh, there are some newer therapies and new guidelines for the use of immunotherapy. Uh, the sort of main treatment for men with cancer that's spread outside the prostate to other parts of the body is called hormonal therapy. That's a medication that is, it's not chemotherapy, it's medication that reduces the man's testosterone level. Um, if a man has been on hormonal therapy and they have some progression of their PSA, uh, there is an option for immunotherapy in select patients uh, that, you know, that have progressed on hormonal therapy. 
there's, there's sort of a new uh, algorithm for those patients that have, have metastatic prostate cancer that have progressed on hormonal therapy. And then it's based upon, you know, to what degree is this man having symptoms? There, there is some uh, effectiveness in prolonging cancer-specific mortality in those patients uh, by uh, a handful of months. It, I believe it's about three or four months. So it's not very specific. Yeah. The, I mean, the, numerically, the, di the data suggests, um, like statistically, it's, it's been shown to be significant, but we're typically referring to a matter of months yeah. of in, in improving you know, life, exp you know, life survival from uh, the cancer standpoint. Yes. You mentioned that uh, you measure the flow of urine at your office, but the flow depending on how much leak you have had, how long before you had it. How do you do that test? Yeah, so that test requires that the patient has a fairly full bladder. So they either come to the office not having urinated for an hour or two. Or when, once they get to the office, they sit in the waiting area and uh, take a few glasses of water. Because you need to have, you know, maybe 150 to 200 milliliters to, to get an accurate assessment. Otherwise, if, the, if your bladder's empty, it's just going to look like trickles anyway. So, yes? I have a question about um, bladder stones. Mm -hmm. Well, it's certain of, certainly one of the uh, incidents that may happen. If you have a large prostate and you're not emptying your bladder adequately and you just have a lot of stagnant urine sitting in the bladder, uh, that's certainly a risk factor to form bladder stones. But is there any reason for a heavy urine bladder like the um, surgery to remove the urethra? Any reason not to have it? Right. Well, I mean, you know, it, depending upon the degree of the man's symptoms, um, if they're, what are their other underlying medical issues? Can they tolerate general anesthesia? Um, those are the, the things that have to be considered. Any other issues from the prostate standpoint? Sure. Yeah, the Euro lift. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at, uh, at an advanced stage, everybody or most people have a, a large prostate. Mm -hmm. So, when would you resort or be a candidate for either of these two uh, surgeries? Is it when you have complete blockage of urination? Uh, something such as the Eurolift, this is typically, you know, planned electively. So if a man has had bothersome symptoms, you know, chronically over the years, if they've started on some of these medications and the symptom improvement does not lead to a, a significantly improved quality of life, then these are one of the elective procedures that you can consider for a man. I mean, there are some you know, anatomical, you know, factors that we have to consider and work the patient up for in the office to see if they're a candidate for this. Um, you know, we have to see, you know, we have to measure how, you know, how large is the prostate. There are some other factors, you know, we typically do a diagnostic cystoscopy in the office, you know, to see, you know, uh, how large is the prostate. Um, if there are certain parts of the prostate that are enlarged, that may, may, that may make the man not a candidate for a Eurolift and more appropriate for some of the other, other tests. For the other, other, another surgery? Yeah, if, if there are certain, you know, parts of the workup that aren't, we don't, um, that the man doesn't qualify for, or if he has other, you know, issues in his anatomy that make it more complex, he may be a candidate for, you know, the traditional TERP, which not only is done with the cautery element, but there's some other ways we can do this by using a, a laser to basically vaporize all of this tissue by heating it up very hot with the camera and then, you know, opening up the channel also. Can, can you call this a preventative kind of thing or is it something that has to be done only after the 
Well, we, we would only do it once a man has started to experience some of those bothersome symptoms and if they've tried medications and don't get enough relief with them. So the first step would be medication? Yeah. Okay. So that was the, the prostate discussion and I wanted to talk about kidney stones for a little bit. Yeah. You, uh, you can, because as I'll discuss, uh, Flomax is one of the most co uh, common medications that's used to help pass kidney stones. So it's used for other reasons also. For frequent urination without, without stuff. Sure. I mean, that's, that's one of the options. I mean, there are, there's a whole other class of medications for overactive bladder, not necessarily due to an enlarged prostate. Um, that work by an entirely different mechanism, um, and that's th those may be more appropriate. But uh, and you and those are you probably see a lot more commercials for nowadays also because there's more medications for that. It's right. It's still it's a prescription drug. The overactive bladder ones. I unfortunately I didn't have as part of this talk. I had uh, kidney stones and and the prostate. Sure, we could we could always do that. <laughs> Which one of those? Yeah. Why would you just not do a Euro or Eurolift? Eurolift? Yeah, I mean, it seems in a way so simple compared to the other other options that you described. Yeah, I mean, for the Eurolift, there um, there's uh, some clinical criteria that a man has to fulfill to. Um, in order to do this, you know, they have to have a certain score, and it, um, some of it has to do with, you know, these, these clinical criteria would indicate that they're good candidates. Other clinical criteria have to do with, um, like, Medicare coverage of these new devices and things. But, you know, it may, part of the things that, ha that are, that determine whether a man's a candidate is how large is their prostate. Prostate, this is only effective for prostates that are you know, of a certain size, you know, 80, 80 grams or less. I mean, 80 grams is just, it's one of the, uh, from a, an effectiveness standpoint, prostates larger than that have been shown not to be, uh, have as much benefit from a Eurolift. Um, there's other parts of the prostate we have to evaluate. So the key thing with Eurolift is that the man only has to have enlargement of these two lobes, the lateral lobes. Many men will have an enlarged, you don't see it here, but they'll have an enlarged middle lobe that sort of projects into the bladder. And if the man does have that, then the Eurolift would not be effective. Um, those are some of the, the key factors. Other things are, you know, typically to do a Eurolift, we have to do the flow study in the office. And it's usually best if the patient has a particularly low flow, because then this has been shown to be beneficial for those patients. Sure. <laughs> so I'll go through, you know, why do stones form? Uh, what are the options for treating kidney stones? Um, and then what are the, some of the things that can be done from a dietary and uh, pharmacologic standpoint to prevent kidney stones? So these form when urine has high levels of minerals and salts. So they'll form, you know, within the kidney so within up here, if the stone starts to pass, it travels down the, the ureter. That takes the urine from the kidney to the bladder. And that's really when a patient starts to develop symptoms is when it gets stuck in the ureter. The kidney continues to make urine. It can't pass, and it gets very swollen, and that's when you'll have pain. So stones are made up of a lot of, uh, you know, there's a variety of stones, the most common of which is a calcium stone. Uh, but you can also have uric acid stones, which can be due to, you know, being overweight, diarrhea, diabetes, gout. If you have a diet that's high in animal protein. You can also have infection stones, such as struvite um, or infection stones. These are related to chronic UTIs. 
These are stones that are particularly large and they grow very fast. You can also have cysteine stones. These are stones that have a genetic predisposition. Uh, you'll have many family members with these stones. You'll have lots of episodes of kidney stones. Um, these patients typically, you know, beginning very young, will have, require a lot of surgery for these stones because they form uh, very frequently. So what are the signs of kidney stones? So if they're sitting in the kidney and the kidney is making urine, it's not blocked, uh, those patients may not have any stones. They may just get a CAT scan for some unrelated reason and you just happen to see that there's a stone in the bladder. But when the stone leaves the kidney and it starts to travel to the bladder, that's when uh, a patient will start to develop symptoms. Uh, you'll have the characteristic flank pain that comes and goes. It's usually very severe, you know, sometimes the worst pain that one's experienced in their life. So sharp cramping pain in the back and the side, it might travel to the front. Patient may feel the need to urinate uh, very urgently. They may have burning, they may see blood in the urine. They might have nausea and vomiting. A man may have uh, pain at, at, you know, in the genitalia as well. So what are the, the common causes of stones? So the possibly one of the most common reasons is uh, dehydration or low urine volume. So if you live in a hot place or you're uh, working in a hot place, you're not staying well hydrated enough, the urine will be concentrated and there's less fluid to keep these salts dissolved. So anyone that does form stones, we strongly encourage them that you know, going forward, they should drink enough water or liquid over the course of a day to produce at least two liters of urine. So that's, you know, if you have like your average bottle of Poland Spring, that means drinking at least four of those over the course of the day. So it's definitely not the easiest thing to do, but it, it is very beneficial if one can achieve that. So when patients think about stones, many times, um, you know, most people think they need to eliminate calcium from their diet entirely. But the key thing to be aware of is that kidney stones may be due to how your body handles calcium, not, it's not due to how much calcium you eat. So if simply eliminating calcium for, from your diet isn't going to keep stones from forming um, because that can actually increase the formation of other kinds of stones, such as oxalate stones. So the important point here is that calcium intake shouldn't be excessive. And usually, whatever one gets from you know, eating regular foods without any supplementation, that's enough calcium that's good enough to prevent the formation of some of these other stones. So bottom line, you should have some calcium in your diet. Sure. So it may mean that your kidney may not reabsorb some of the calcium. Uh, it may be spilling too much calcium into the urine. Similarly, your, your bowels may be reabsorbing too much calcium also. Yeah, or, you know, some patients may have, you know, as part of the workup, we may find out that a patient has an overactive parathyroid gland. So sometimes a way to prevent stones is to send them to an ear, nose, and throat doctor and get their parathyroid glands removed, and then they have no more kidney stones. So, so the next key point really is salt, which is, you know, minimizing salt is important for cardiovascular health, but it's important because uh, too much salt in the diet is a risk for calcium stones. Uh, when you have salt in the urine, it prevents calcium from being reabsorbed back into your body. So a high salt diet will put you at a higher risk for forming calcium stones. So of the things we've discussed so far, you know, keeping yourself well hydrated, eating uh, a moderate amount of calcium, but minimizing the amount of salt in your diet. Oxalate is another important component of kidney stones, and uh, this can be due to dietary factors, but as I mentioned, 
calcium is what binds oxalates. So if you wipe out calcium from your diet, you start forming more oxalate stones. So if, if we find out that a patient does have an oxalate stone, these are some of the foods that need to be eaten in moderation. Or if you have a lot of these foods in your diet, or if you have a, you know, an event or a dinner where there is a lot of these foods, it's, sometimes it's important to just make sure you drink more water at those times just to you know, help dissolve the oxalate in the diet. So, and of these, rhubarb is the highest containing oxalate food. So animal protein, whether it's beef, fish, chicken, or pork, these can raise acid levels in the body and in the urine. Um, this may make it easier for calcium and uric acid stones to form. So if we find out that a patient has either a uric acid stone or a calcium oxalate stone, you know, again, they don't have to eliminate these entirely, but, you know, eat them in moderation or consider other non-animal protein sources. Um, there's some other conditions that can put a patient at risk for stones. You know, if a patient has an inflammatory bowel disease, such as Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, if they've had gastric bypass surgery, um, diarrhea, uh, these can all put patients at risk of forming oxalate stones. Um, obesity can contribute. I'm just going to go through these a little bit more quickly. There's some other you know, medical conditions that I'm, such as, you know, some that I mentioned, you know, the genetic disorders such as cystinuria, you know, if you have an overactive parathyroid gland, some other, you know, less common uh, conditions that one can have making them prone to kidney stones. Cystinuria, so cysteine stones, uh, it's a kind of a amino acid, um, that if there is a gene, that if you have, you know, two copies of this gene, you'll form a lot of these stones. Um, family history, medications, you know, certainly, you know, excessive supplementation of calcium may contribute to stones. So how do we diagnose stones? So... Uh, many times, you know, a patient may have an x-ray for or a CAT scan for an unrelated reason, and they'll see a stone that's sitting in the kidney, or if the patient has, you know, a new episode of severe pain or blood in the urine, they'll have, you know, they'll come to the ER, a scan will be done, and that's when they'll be diagnosed for the first time. So how do we treat the kidney stones? So this depends on, you know, how many stones does the patient have, where is the stone located, and how many of the stones do they have? If a patient has a single stone that's on the smaller side, less than five millimeters, uh, many times the can, these can be passed spontaneously. But there's some things that we can do to help pass the stones. Uh, so the, the key thing, obviously, is to, to make, the, make sure you stay well hydrated. But Flomax will relax the ureter and this will make it easier for the stone to pass. So both men and women with stones will be placed on Flomax. Surgery becomes an option during the following key scenarios. If, if we've tried the Flomax for several weeks and if we do some follow-up tests that show the stone hasn't passed, if the patient just has pain that is too severe, that they require IV medication, you know, nothing orally is controlling the pain, or if they've been shown to have you know, kidney dysfunction because the stone is, is blocking the kidney and it starts to fail. So there's a variety of options. You know, some are minimally invasive, some are more invasive. It's a matter of the, the simplest is if you know, twice a month there's a machine that comes to the Tully Center. And basically this machine delivers some shocks to the patient's back. And this basically breaks up the stone into small pieces and then these would pass in the urine spontaneously. Um, there's more invasive options. We may put cameras, you know, through the penis up into the, or, or through the, the woman's urethra up into the kidney. If it's a very big stone, we may have to go through the patient's back to break it up. Are these shocks uh, radioactive? 
There, it's basically an ultrasound device that delivers shocks to the back. And then during the procedure, we use uh, some x-rays to monitor that the stone's fragmenting well. So I have a couple other slides to, to go through, um, but I'll go through a little bit more quickly in the interest of time. Basically, if a patient has recurrent stones or if they have multiple stones, those patients should be worked up further. And the key part of that test is where we have them collect their urine for 24 hours. Um, and then basically, you know, after that urine has been analyzed, we can look at all of the components in the urine to see what puts them at risk for forming stones. So it may be as, as simply just the patient needs to be more hydrated. Uh, it may be a matter of eliminating salt in the diet, you know, eliminating these kinds of high salt containing foods. Um, it may be, uh, you know, maybe they're not getting enough calcium in their diet, so they need to, you know, eat three to four servings of calcium rich food. Uh, they're not getting fruits and vegetables. They're eating too many of the foods with oxalate. They have a lot of spinach, almonds, tea. They form cal you know, oxalate stones, so they need to cut back on those things. Um, if they're forming the other kinds of stones, the uric acid stones or cysteine or calcium oxalate, they may need to cut back on you know, animal proteins. If dietary measures you know, and then we, we institute the dietary measures, and then three, three to six months later, we can always repeat the urine tests and see, you know, what are their parameters now? Are they, or have they, you know, recovered completely? Are they in a very favorable environment to not form stones, or do they still need to alter some things? So some patients may be placed on medications as well to help prevent the formation of stones. Um, some of which are, you know, potassium citrate. So citrate's something, one of the key components to prevent stones. Uh, this helps raise the pH of the urine. So uh, ways you can do this naturally are just adding lemon to your water, drinking lemonade, or even the clear sodas such as Sprite or 7-Up have citric acid. So if one is going to drink soda from a kidney stone standpoint, it would be best to drink, you know, Sprite or 7-Up as opposed to, you know, Coke or Pepsi because they have phosphoric acid. Uh, as far as the other thing here, you know, thiazide diuretics, many patients with high blood pressure are on hydrochlorothiazide, and that's actually one of the medications that can be considered to help prevent, you know, calcium stones as well. So, you know, there's a variety of things that can be done to prevent stones, you know, simply hydrating oneself, you know, changing dietary components, um, instituting medications. So there are a lot of non-surgical options ultimately as well. And I think that was the last slide I had from the, the kidney stone standpoint. Any questions from the kidney stone standpoint? Sure. No, on a different subject. Sure, or any, any topic obviously is fine. Right, the main one is the PSA, which is usually the test that a, your primary doctor would discuss with you, and it's the prostate-specific antigen, so it's... Okay, so that's, it's PSA. Right. That would be the, the first step, and then it has to be interpreted in light of the patient's race and their age range, right. because the, the normal range differs based on that also. What duration? So it depends upon what risk of prostate cancer the patient has. So usually when a patient is newly diagnosed, we look at all of the clinical information and then we can classify them as low, intermediate, or high risk. 
and that will determine what duration of hormonal therapy is appropriate. So those men that are considered high-risk prostate cancer will typically be placed on hormonal therapy for two to three years. If you're intermediate risk, it may be four to six months of uh, hormonal therapy. Yes? In the physical exam, what kind of test can you perform for a kidney stone possibility? Potential for kidney stone? Well, well some of the uh, uh, clinically, you know, on exam, if a patient has some flank tenderness where, you know, it's called, it's right where the, your back meets the lower part of the rib cage. That's typically right over the kidney. That can be certainly a sign of possibly a urinary tract infection that's gone up to the kidneys or possibly an obstructing kidney stone. Um, aside from that, we look at urine tests. Kidney stones are, are a common cause of microscopic or visible blood in the urine. Uh, but many times it's, you know, imaging, whether it's an ultrasound or a CAT scan that's been performed. That's usually, I mean, well, once you have that done, if it shows a stone, then you know it's, what's going on. Or if a man, you know, is pat or a woman is passing stone debris in their urine, that's certainly an indicator that maybe they warrant some imaging to find out what's going on. Any other questions or anything? All right. Thank, thank you for having me again. Appreciate it.